Can I talk about the rugby for a bit? I'm trying to use up space here, guys. I was asked to preach this morning. So the, the, the rugby spelt R U. <laughs> uh, how, how, France. And we won by one point. And I thought, wow. I thought, wow. And I wanted to vomit. Didn't you? So I thought, oh, England. Hmm. The wonderful thing about the England game is we beat them in the cricket the same weekend. There's no one from England here, is there? It's hard for English people to leave the country now. And then last week, all I can say is God saw this nation. Hey? So for those of you who are struggling with your rugby game, if you just win, if you just have a gain in life, and it's one point, one point is better than defeat. That's true. Because on the scoreboard it says, you're the winner. And you know, I think there may be some of you here who don't feel like you're winning. You feel like, well, I need a win by a bigger points. But one point is a win. It's enough. It's like um, when you aim at school for 99%. I never aimed. I just want you to know that was never a possibility for me, firstly. And secondly, I didn't even know how to spell 99. But when you get employed, no one asks, what did you get for math? We measure wrong. And the world we live in, the world is measured wrong. The world we live in, we measure by success, don't we? How much we've achieved. We've just come back from Australia. First world, Paul, where's Paul? First world. First world. We came from Brazil. No world. To Australia, first world. It all works. And... It's beautiful. It's amazing. But I've been to all sides of the planet in my life, and I've always observed, so what is success for people? The boat you drive? Do you drive a boat or sail a boat? It's got an engine. You drive it. Hey, like a submarine. You drive a submarine. Drive an airplane. Fly an airplane. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It's not what matters on the outside as much as we think it does. A significant life is a life of meaning. It's not fake. And I've just come from a first world country and a lot of fake. And you know, this life of significant, it applies to every aspect of our lives. Significant becomes increasingly evident in our lives, within us and outwardly. So does fake. Fake increasingly becomes evident in us and in the way we live out our lives and around us. We hear the words of the preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is meaningless. Everything. Breathing, making love, having friends, Working, everything is meaningless. You read that book, you become super depressed. Everything. And you know, the truth is when we look around, or if we're brave enough to look in, I think the writer of Ecclesiastes is more right than wrong, actually. Look around. Everything seems meaningless. There's a lot of fake going on. A lot of fake. A lot of fake going on in us. A lot of fake going on in the world. When every week, every month, almost every month this year, someone in the church circle has fallen because of immorality. But no one knew. No one knew. Everything looked good. Everything was good. What's going on? 
Why are we not looking in enough? Why are we not being honest enough? Why are we not pursuing a life of meaning? A life of meaning is much harder to pursue than a life of fake. Because we have to be serious. And then, we, and then we hear the words of Jesus. And look, I look around and I think, I think most of you know who Jesus is. We hear these words of Jesus and he says, I've come that you might have life. And we go, oh, well, that's a cool verse. I'll underline that. But do we know what that means to us? Because attached to that word is, I've come that you might have an abundant life. Do we even know what abundance is? We look in the world that we live in. We see the toys people have, the stuff they have, the wealth, and we go, that's abundance. That's what we should be, we should be pursuing. And shame on the church, that's what we pursued. Jesus said, not only that, that we would live very, very fruitful lives. Very fruitful lives. Meaningful life. So what's happening? What's happening? I've been reading, while I've been away, I've been reading the epistle of John. You know, John, John was God's favorite, you know? Well, John thought he was his favorite. He writes these words in John 1 John 3, 23 to 24. I'm going to read it. This is his commandment. Very clear. This is Jesus' commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. How's that? This is the ultimate commandment of God. He's saying this. This is my commandment. That you believe in the one and only, the only son, Jesus Christ, comma, and love one another. It's like bookends. Think about that. And that's it. There's a full stop. Then he says this, and the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, remains in him, has an intimate relationship with him, knows him, knows his words, knows his ways, lives his life, understands his mind. The people who abide in him, they are the ones who obey his commandments, and he is in them. And we know this, that he abides in us, that He lives in us, that He knows us. He knows our ways, our thoughts, our every action, everything we're thinking we're going to do, but we hope no one will know what we're going to do. He knows everything about us. Nothing is hidden from His sight. He abides in us by His Spirit, whom He gave us. We've been invaded as Jesus followers. There's nothing you can do if you're a Jesus follower. There's absolutely nothing you can do about this. You have been invaded by the presence of of God. And he is sticking to you closer than a brother. I love what Eugene Peterson says on this text. He says, again, this is God's command. To believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. You know there are lots of Jesus Christs. There are lots of saviors in the world. You know that, eh? But there is only one who saves us. Only one. There's only one that can change your heart and life. The personally chosen Son of God, Jesus Christ. And you can choose who you want. You can choose the Jesus you want. You can choose its free will. You can make those choices. But if you want a significant life, if you want a life that is full of meaning, if you want abundance and fruitfulness, then there's only one Jesus that you have to believe in. Jesus Christ, the personally chosen Son of God. And then Eugene Peterson unpacks this and he says this. As we keep his commands, as we keep his commands, on the one hand is believe in Jesus, and on the other hand is love one another. He says, as we keep his commandments, we live deeply and surely. In him. That word surely means with great certainty. As, as we keep his commands, as we believe in him, believe in Jesus, only one, push aside all the other stuff. We just hold on to Jesus and we say, I believe you, Lord. I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God that you died upon the cross 
And that your blood washed away my sin and I'm a regenerated, brand new creation. Designed to live in abundance and meaning and fruitfulness. Designed for eternity with you. As we believe in Jesus and then come and love one another. And I'll unpack that another stage because it's, it's quite amazing that he slots those two things. Those two commandments. Just two commandments. You know, there are hundreds of commandments before Malachi. Did you know that? Before the book of Matthew. Hundreds started out with ten, ended up with hundreds. And Jesus goes, hey, there's just two. Just two. Believe in me and love one another. Wow. And he says, and if we do this, we live deeply and with great certainty in him. And he lives in us. You know, in the beginning, when God made creation and he made men and women, he gave them the greatest gift, the gift of choice. Isn't that amazing? You and I have choice. We're not manipulated. We're not hypnotized. We, we choose. When he appears before us and says, come follow me, we go, yes, no, yes, no. And then when you say yes, you're activating your choice. If you say no... You're activating your God-given choice to say no to God. How's that? I'm going to reverse it. God chooses. He has one choice. He chooses to live in us. Done. Period. Isn't that amazing? He, he's chosen to live in us. It's not like a, a book, the architect's book of what to do. When creation is done and completed, uh, oh, wow, oh wow, I've got to live in these guys. There's only one, one thing written in the heart of God. I will live in my people. I feel very happy with that. Can't shake them off. Can't shake them out. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us. How does that work? He sent his spirit to live in us. Hmm. A significant life is a deep and certain life in the Spirit. What God is saying to us is that if you and I want to live a meaningful life, it starts with believing in the one and only Jesus Christ. And it continues as we love one another. A significant life is a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ and his ways. And you've heard this, haven't you? Well, if you've been in this church, you've heard me say this. A significant life is a life surrendered to Jesus. It's a life in his spirit. And it's a life with the spirit in us. The presence of God in us. It's resurrection life and living. That's what this is. This is not religion. This is not being a good churchman or churchwoman. This is about being the people of God in whom God dwells and in, among whom God lives. It's resurrection living. It's life of power. It's powerful life. It's abundant life. It's very fruitful living. It's optimal living. In between these two bookends is a life that some of us haven't even started tapping into. But the Bible says there's a, a rich experience as he abides, as his presence abides in us. There's this deep certainty of life that we experience. And the world out there, God is saying, it is meaningless. <coughs> but there's meaning in me. That's what God is saying. There's meaning in me. So what does this life look like? I, I think I, you might have remembered if you... When, if you were here in September, I spoke, I spoke at length on uh, the significant life. You might have remembered that I mentioned uh, that some of the important aspects of what a significant life could look like. Uh, th for me, there are three words that help us navigate our way into a life of significance. I don't think it just happens. I don't think you just wake up in the morning and go, I'm significant. I'm, my life's full of meaning. I don't think that's the way it works. 
I think there's like a process, you know, it's like a, a collection of, of right choices in the right direction focusing on Jesus that lead us into this life. And uh, um, for me, the three words would be authenticity, simplicity, and intimacy. You get down to bedrock. For me, those are the, for me, those are the things that, that enable me and will enable us to navigate our way into an honest life of significance with God. I'll tell you what significance is not. Significance is not an individualistic life. That's what significance is not. Significance is not a loner life. It's not. Look at the bookends that I mentioned. The scriptures mention love one another. It's not possible for a significant life to be done on your own. We weren't created like that. We we're created in the image of us. We are created to be together. A, a, a significant life is not a me first, me only life. It's not. Because a significant life is about Jesus. Jesus. And believing in Him. And a significant life is about loving each other. That's what the Scriptures say. Love one another. It's not possible to be on your own then. If you're a Jesus follower, and you're following Him, you're following Him together. It's not like you're on your 5,000 meter run on your own in the front. This is a group effort. We're on this journey together. It's about a one another life. It's about a together life. It's about a shared life. And I want to tell you, I'm going to, just, I want to tell you something. It's terrifying, this life. Because we've been taught on your own is better. It's better to be independent. That's what this world has done for ages. Every new age that comes along, it makes you more and more individualistic. From the moment of enlightenment into this technological age we're in, the ages have drawn us away from one another into individualism. That's why when you mention the Christian life is about a family, most people go, oh, you don't understand family. I understand family. and Family is bad. Right? Am I right? I've been hurt by family. It's much better to be on my own. I can fight these battles on my own. You can't. That's true. Because when you're looking there, the devil hits you on your head in the back. True story. And you look around, the oak hits you there. You can, can't do this on your own. It's a true story. And a shared life. The shared life. Does that mean I have to be vulnerable and, 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 sh and share? Because sharing is scary. I can't tell you how I'm feeling because if, if I tell you, you'll run out screaming. So it's not easy, is it? <laughs> but the opposite is meaningless. The significant life is about daring to take the risk to love somebody, to love others, to love and to be loved back. That's a significant life. Significant life is the opposite of distance. It's the opposite of separation and detachment, alienation. It's the opposite of coldness and remoteness and estrangement and aloofness. It's the absolute opposite. A significant life is about courage and vulnerability. It's about leaning into these love relationships. That's what it's about. It's leaning in. You know, uh, Eliana is the funniest person I know, but she doesn't know she's funny. She's just funny weird. So there's these moments that I've watched Leanne that she will just go and she'll lean on one of the kids and she just lets go, eh? It's like all her weight, all 45 kilograms of her leaning full on you. Not holding you, just leaning like, like a drunk oak. You know what I mean? Hey, Matt. <laughs> You're just leaning. All your weight is in that direction. And she leans. And you know what becomes awkward? It's like, we don't know what to do. Do we hold her up? Do we step back and let her clump down on the floor? What do we do? 
And she has irritated my kids like that. Forever. But we all know we just got to somehow hold on to this. You see, a significant life is leaning into relationships because they the people you love and you trust and you believe in the deepest part of your being. They love you and they trust you. And we all want that life. True story. We all want to be able to lean like Leanne. The significant life is embracing the truth that we need other people in our lives, Jilly. We need them. We need them. They're not added extras. They are the main meal. They're the meat and potatoes. It's all about that. A significant life, true story, is about love. Now I'm going to change the word love. Can I do that? I'm going to, make it, I'm going to mention a scary word here. Intimacy. <laughs> Intimacy means this. A feeling of being close. Okay, hands, hands. Who's ever had a, ever had a feeling of being close to someone? Hey? It's a cool feeling, hey? And it's also quite scary, hey? It's like both end. It's a feeling of being close and emotionally connected and supported. Who's ever felt, ever felt emotionally connected to somebody and supported? Hey? It's a, it's a cool feeling, hey? But it's also like, it's like scary. It's like, how does this work? And then intimacy is also about sexual intercourse. No hands needing to go up <laughs> on this one in case I get disappointed by the back table or two. <laughs> but it just push that button a bit. A marriage is about friendship. Correct. But a marriage is about intimacy. Correct. And intimacy is about sexual intercourse. Correct. In marriage. Correct. And you take that out, you're just friends. Marriage is unique. And you know, the scripture teaches us the, the mystery of marriage is like the mystery of the church and God. We need intimacy with each other. And intimacy is risky business because it's when you are intimate, you're all in. You're all in. There's no like half in. It's all in love. It's all in love. Intimacy about being vulnerable. You, you're not intimate with everyone. But the people you are intimate with, you're vulnerable with them. And that takes courage. You have to be courageous to love. Intimacy is about declaring your intentions. Now, I'm a declarer. I declare my intentions to my family and to most people. I, I love people. I love saying I love you. And I don't just say I love you because it's something I read in the book. You better say, Pastor 101. Oh, yeah, tell people you love them. <laughs> I, I love people. If I say I love you, I love you. You know that, Matt. It's a true story. And, and when I met my girl, she was 14. That's only like 20 years ago. <laughs> We've known each other for 40 something years, as long as 47 years or something. And, uh, and, and she was the first person I think I fell in love with. I was 15. And it didn't take long for us to say, We love, I love you, I love you. Hey? It's like, uh, Remember Mary saying, I mean, Mary said, I love you. Hey? Like, whoop. <laughs> Captain Walmart, bro, hey? Captain Walmart. Intimacy is the declaration of the heart. That's what intimacy is. You say it. You know, Jesus says, what's in the heart comes out the mouth. Not just bad stuff, guys. Don't just think bad stuff in your heart. There's lots of good stuff in your heart. 
but it also comes out. The, the scriptures say that we must love, not just with lip service, but we must love in deed and truth. And true story, only we know if we love a person, correct? No one else knows. Hey, Lorraine, only you know you love a person, true. But only you know if you are in love with a person. So back to Matt and Mary. Do you remember when Mary said to you, Matt, I'm in love with you. At that point, everything changes. It's a, it's, it's, we think, oh, but that's such a subtle difference. It is a massive difference. The de declaration of our intentions and intimacy is saying to God, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. But when last did we say, I'm in love with you, Lord? Everything changes in our psyche at that very moment. Everything about us, our bones, our bodies, our minds, our emotions, everything is sucked into that moment of declaration of intent. And for me, that's a truth declared. That's a truth declared. Do you remember the conversation that Jesus had with Peter right at the end? Of John started like this after breakfast Jesus said to Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these yes Lord Peter said you know I love you then feed my lambs Jesus said to him then Jesus repeated the question Simon son of John do you love me Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then, then take care of my sheep, said Jesus. And then Peter thought, hey, man, I got this right. Hey, two love questions in a row, man. Let me check. It's in the book. Oh, flip there, three. Simon, son of John. Do you love me? Now I'm going to change it. Because that word in the Greek changes. It's an intimate word. Are you in love with me? Everything at that point changes in Peter. He gets angry, frustrated with Jesus, exposed, vulnerable. But he needs to be courageous at this point. He needs to be courageous. And he says this, Lord, you know everything. And you know. That I'm in love with you. You know it. You know, Lord, I'm in love with you. Then feed my sheep. You see, intimacy is a declaration of intent. Hey, Cheryl, how's one of those tissues? Please, man. Are you okay? Thank you. I've got a whole pack, man. Thank you. I'll keep it here in my pocket, eh? I think we're going south in this sermon, eh? Hey. You remember what I said? Intimacy is a declaration of intent. Do you love me? God is asking us today, do you love me? And I want to tell you what he's not wanting to hear. Yes, Lord, I know you love me. I know you know I love me. No, I'll try and get this right. This is what he's not wanting to hear. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He's wanting to hear this. Yes, Lord, you know I'm in love with you. If I never said that to Leanne, often nearly every day, 
We would just be friends, husband and wife. But we're not. We're lovers. We're friends. We, we have a relationship that is, doesn't matter what happens. We are in love with each other. Something changes about it. You can't really fully explain it. But something changes about the relationship. It's the same with God. If we don't say that to Him, and we don't, it doesn't come out of our heart. Because you can't say it if it's not in your heart. Because what's in your heart comes out your mouth. Then we need to have a heart change. We need to go back and find out what's stopping us from being in love with Jesus. What's stopping us? Intimacy. Lean into intimacy. Intimacy is about proximity. And that means being intentionally close. Being intentionally. I irritate Leanne. Eh? I love hugging her and holding her. And I, I, I'm a hugger, man. It, it, it's good for me to do that. Something happens in me when I can hug the people I love. Proximity is about drawing close. It's about leaning in. Lean into intimacy. It reminds me of the story of John and, G and, and Peter and Jesus. So at the end of John. So there's John, and it says this in, 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 in the John... Jesus, uh, John is lying back on Jesus' chest. And it says this, the disciple Jesus loved. That's awkward, eh? What about the other 11? <laughs> and one of the other 11 was Simon. He was a bit jealous, yellowish. So Simon nodded at this disciple and said to him, tell, me, tell us who it is of whom you are speaking of whom he is speaking. So it goes straight to John. He said, so who do you think he's speaking about? Who do you think Jesus loves? So he takes a daisy out. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He then simply leaned back on Jesus' chest and said to Jesus, Lord, who is it? Who is it that loves you? That, that's not, not going to die. Who is it that you love like this? So, so back to Matt and Mary. Do you remember when you had Reuben... And you put your ear on his chest. And you heard that little heartbeat. Do you remember that moment? Hey? I remember we used to often do that. Listen to the kid's heartbeat. And then Leanne and I often, every now and then, she's weird. She put her head on my chest just to check if I've got a heart, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, so why, why, why do we do? Why do we lean in onto someone's chest? Answer, answer simple. To hear the heartbeat. When we lean into intimacy, we catch and we hear, intimacy with God, we catch and we hear the heartbeat of our Father. And it's a rhythm that we so desperately need. It's a rhythm of grace. It's a different rhythm. It's unlike ours. And He wants us to get that rhythm. He wants us to lean in and to hear the rhythm of His heart so that our lives can be synchronized with Him and that we'll walk at His speed, and live at His speed, and not rush our lives away. Now, as the disciples were traveling along, they entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed her, Jesus into her home. And Martha had a sister called Mary, who was also seated at the Lord's feet and was listening to his words. Just instantly. 
Martha, come into my house. And he comes in and he sits down or reclines on the floor. And um, at that very moment, Mary, the sister, comes and sits at Jesus' feet. Just sits there and just starts staring at him and listening to him. And so Martha was distracted by all the things that she was doing. And she came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the job, all the work? I'm serving you on my own. By the way, can't you see how good I'm at serving you, Lord? I'm so good at this, Lord. I'm like the, I'm a super server. Please, can I have a badge? Please, can you tell my sister how much she sucks? And what a super server I am. Well, it sounds like us, doesn't it? And then he goes this, and Jesus looked at her and he said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Only one thing is necessary, Martha. Only one thing. And this will not be taken away from her. I'll tell you what it is. To learn to live in the presence of God. And when we lean in to Jesus, we are learning to live in the presence of God. If we lean in, you know what happens? We hear what Jesus is saying. We're not distracted by the other voices. But we, it, takes, it takes like commitment. It, it takes devotion. It, there's a price to pay in leaning into Jesus. But if we do, we will hear his voice. We'll hear what he says. You know what we will hear? We'll hear... Keith, we'll hear this. I love you, Keith Blonde. You're my man. That's what we'll hear. But you know when we're distracted, we, you know what we want to hear? Oh, Lord, I want my plan for my life. That's what we want to hear. Well, what shall I do, Lord? How many mountains must I climb? How many churches must I pass? How, what must I do? How can we increase the church? Lord? Give me a plan. We, when we're distracted from the Lord and we're not living in intimacy, we hear the wrong things. And those godly distractions push us away from Jesus, I'm telling you now. Because if they didn't, the mighty men of God would not have fallen. We hear his affirmations. We, we hear about his ways. Jesus tells us about his ways. Jesus. Not the, not the church, not the doctrine, not the, the thing of uh, Jesus tells us about. And then we become confident on how we should live with Jesus. Correct. Not how we should live for the church. Don't live for the church. Live for Jesus. Be happy. Because if you heard his rhythm, it's grace, then you'll know how to live in grace. We'll hear about the life he's called us to live. And we'll go, we can argue with him, Lord, it, it's so hard, Lord. Why did you say on all those good Beatitudes things, the last one will be persecuted? That sucks. I bet no one's underlined that. No one. No one reads Peter. You will face many trials. That's not underlined in my Bible. What's underlined in my Bible is, if you give, <laughs> it will be given back to you. Am I right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Undermine. Greater is he that is in me. And it's true. But if we sit and lean with Jesus, we'll hear about the life he's called us to. And we'll hear him saying this. But I've provided for that. I'll get you through it. Are your distractions hard, eh? This is my tissue phone. And when we, when we hear the words of Jesus, listen to this, when you hear the words of Jesus, our faith is built on the words of Jesus. Our faith is not built on doctrine or theology. Our faith is not even built on what Moses, Abraham, and Isaac said. Our faith is built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? That's how our faith is built, on the good news of Jesus, the things he says. And you know that faith enables us to trust him. Do you know that? 
all of a sudden, I have faith. Now I can trust him. What he says, I can trust him. And you know, trust then empowers us to obey. Oh man, if only we could just find space to lean in. And when you lean in, you also find you get his wisdom for our everyday lives and living. So intimacy declares our intentions. I'm in love with you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. We could change that song if you want. Intimacy is about proximity. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. You know, when we sing those songs, we all start crying. Why? Because it's what we want. Last page. A significant life is a series of choices in every aspect of our lives. A significant life. A series of choices every, in every aspect of life. Authenticity, simplicity, and intimacy become woven parts of the fabric of our being, of our faith. We have an authentic faith a simplistic faith, an intimate faith of our families. We have a real family. Are you okay, buddy? Cool beans, man. Of our relationships. You can't have a relationship if you're not going to be real. You can't have a relationship if your life is cluttered with stuff. You're so busy on your phone, you're not even talking to friends anymore. Work that out. We are so distracted. Simplicity, authenticity, and intimacy have to become part of our lifestyle. The truth is we don't need all the stuff we think we need. We don't need all the stuff advertising agencies tell us we need. Sorry, Noon. We know we need it because they're telling us we need it. But do we need it? I mean, I can't tell you what to do. So our, our rubbish bin guys, they come on Thursday mornings. It's a bit of an exercise in our family. And um, man, they love Leanne. Eh? She walks out sometimes in a gown with a, a tray of hot tea for these oaks. It's like, flippin' heck. They love her. And they are... So excited. You can't believe. Mama, mama, you can't believe. Mama, mama, you can't believe. Next door gave us five pairs of, Ast what are they called? Aztecs running shoes. Five pairs of Aztecs running shoes. <laughs> they were second hand. They were so stoked. Hey? Lifestyle. A significant life is a series of choices in every aspect of our lives, in our faith, in our marriage, in our families, with our friendships, in our lifestyle, being a church, being a church, being a church. I'll be frank, eh? Because I can't be earnest. <laughs> to be frank is a, a statement that we've learned from our Brazilian friend Marcelo to be frank Brett a church if this church is not real enough for you then you must tell us because we want to be real if this church family is not expressing simplicity in what we do, you must tell us. Because we want that. We want to lean into intimacy here. We want people to believe in the one and only Jesus Christ. And we want people to love one another. And in between, to live significantly meaningful, rich, abundant, optimal lives in the presence of God. That's what we want. It all starts, all this starts with believing in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you this morning, as I ask myself, do we believe? 
Do we believe? Do we really believe that Jesus Christ is the chosen, the one and only Son of the living God? Do we really believe that? Wow, I love that. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that response. I should have made it more preachy. Do we believe that he is the only one who saves us and forgives us of our sin and our selfishness? Do we really believe in Jesus? And if you do, if we do, if you do, have you declared your intentions to him? Because we can believe and stay mute. Can you see how this question changes now? Because a lot of people believe, Paul said, and even the demons believe, and yet they tremble. But if we truly believe, then we should declare our intentions. We are in love with you, Lord. And we will sing it, and we will live it, and we will be these people so that those who don't know you, who are far from you, can know there is another option for life. The only option for significance, to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you do, are we, are you, intentionally drawing close to him? Intentionally drawing closer to him. That yesterday you go, man, you won't believe what a great day I had with Jesus. And today is going to be better. I just know he's going to say something to me. I know I'm going to feel his presence. I know he's going to use me with his mercy and love to pray for someone, to, to care for someone, to feed someone. Man, I love being close to Jesus. So, to the preacher of Ecclesiastes, I say this. You are right, but you are wrong. It's not all meaningless. Jesus Christ has come along. And we are living significant, meaningful, abundant, fruitful, optimal lives. Because we believe. And we love one another. Amen.